report everybody that has um, attended, okay? So I need you to go to the chat. So you go to more and then open chat, unless like it's already open for you. And then you put your name and county, okay? Okay, Sarah Coleman, where are you? Sarah Coleman, got it. Sarah Coleman, where the heck did you go, Sarah? Oh my, hold on. Okay. I think we have uh, everybody here that's the speaker. Um, and I have, um, we have 53 participants tonight. And like I said, I'm going to be recording this and putting on our website, as well as um, sending to you all the link because it's going to be on YouTube. So then I can send uh, to all the leaders the link just so you can go back and watch it again. Okay. And if it's okay with you all, we're going to go ahead and start so we can uh, get out of here in a timely manner. Okay. So first of all, you guys have, I send to all of you the guidelines and the, um, the agenda for tonight, correct? So you guys someone, have that in front of you. Someone has a raised, someone has a raised hand. Sharon. Parker. Sharon. Sharon. Uh, hello? Well, I thought she was there. She seems to be there, but um, I guess if you guys have any questions, it's better to type on the chat than to raise hand because raised hands will probably be missed. Okay. Because like we are going to be paying attention to PowerPoints and stuff like that. So uh, let me just start out by saying thank you all for joining us today. We are super, super excited to be offering, to be starting this program, this project within the Kentucky 4-H Horse Program. Um, I'm gonna ask everybody, if you haven't muted yourself, to go ahead and mute yourself. Um, and it is a privilege to oversee this program in Kentucky for me. And I love, you know, I, 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 I owe a lot of the success of this program uh, to the, the volunteer leaders. And some of you have been leaders for decades and I depend on you all for the success of this program. But what I have felt throughout the years is that we have a group of kids that do the knowledge contest and then a group of kids that do the horse show. And then the kids that ride for more uh, recreation or for fun, or for, for whatever reason that they may not like to show or being left outside and being left behind. So uh, in meeting with you know my friends that are gonna be speakers here tonight also, and meeting with uh, the district county agents, the district uh, horse contact agents, we decided to roll out this program uh, with a trail riding project. How does that work? Right now we're rolling out trail riding. So, it is going to be the kids can log their hours and then whoever rides more is going to win an award at the end of the year. The year is going to be January 1st through December 31st. Okay, so that's one of the things. I have a log hour sheet in the guidelines that I have sent to all of you. It's going to also be on our website. And also there's going to be apps, which is in the guidelines. There's three different apps that have been tried and um, we like two the most, uh, but they, they, the three of them work that you can log on your hours. You can log on um, how many miles you rode, et cetera, and et cetera. So they're really, really um, handy. And then you can download and just send that to us also. Um, Obviously, with the logging hours, this is mainly like a honor system, but I want the leaders to sign off on the logging hours of the kids. Uh, and then the agent has to sign also, uh, you know, because we're going to do this now because of the award that kids are going to be um, competing for. 
Now, the other thing is that there's going to be a few other competitions that we're thinking about. We haven't decided 100% yet, but there is competitive trail that we, may, that we may actually offer together with the Kentucky Horse Council. We are going to uh, be planning for a statewide trail ride and a cookout in some uh, centrally located um, state trail, uh, state park. So uh, just so you guys can, you know, so we can build a better uh, community camaraderie that adults and kids can ride together as opposed to the state show which only kids can ride right but we adults like to ride too so uh so these are the goals of our trail riding projects to allow us to have more fun instead of just focusing on showing horses and grooming horses for showmanship right which is all good but trail riding the show happens once a year right so let's go ahead and have fun every single week of the year. So that being said, as we start this program, and I know a lot of you trail ride all the time and every week, and I know Renee does. Um, and um, I know a lot of you ride every weekend. And I just, here's the thing that I want you guys to understand. If this is to be a club event, the 4-H rules apply, okay? What is the 4-H rule? So helmet for the kids, and I know some of you, when at home, don't wear them, and that's, I don't care about that. But if it's a 4-H club event, you guys need to abide by the rules of 4-H, okay? Because when you abide by those, if something happens, you're covered with insurance, okay? What kind of insurance? The excess health insurance, and also if there is some sort of uh, lawsuit, uh, the 4-H will cover that as well. So it's important for you guys, if having a club, a 4 H club event trail ride, it, you need to follow the 4 H rules, okay? Otherwise, the insurance is not going to cover you all. Make sense? Yes, it does make sense. Okay, so this is, uh, so today we're going to talk about a few of, of the things that we have here. So I have a bunch of speakers, and what I'm going to ask you to do is if you have any questions, instead of asking as the speakers are, are, are talking, please send it on the chat, okay? So, Please send it on the chat so um, we can, um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask them in the end of it all, okay? So uh, we're going to start with uh, Miss Edith Conyers. Uh, she is going to be talking about safety and uh, she trail rides weekly and monthly and daily. And so she is wonderful and she has been doing it for a ton of years. And that's why she's gonna be talking. She is an adult just like us. And I want this program to include the adults as well. Gracie, you are gonna to have to stop doing that or I'm gonna actually have to kick you out of the program. There we go. Yep. She is gonna to have to be disconnected. <laughs> she's just looking at me. Oh, fuck, I'm on mute. Yeah. All right, uh, eat it. Yeah, I, okay. I think I've unmuted myself appropriately. Um, basically, safety on the trail is probably one of the most important things that um, everybody, kids and adults alike, can have to deal with. And later on, you'll hear about etiquette or manners and I, I want to just kind of in, in say that you, etiquette and good manners equals safety on the trail a great deal of the time. Uh, as as Fernanda has already said, you always want to wear um, a helmet. And when you get to the point of logging miles, it's going to be very important um, to wear a helmet because that will be considered if you wish your log miles to be signed off for on you'll need to be wearing a helmet when you are riding and wanting to log miles you should wear one all the time uh, preferably it's safer to ride with another person and or tell a, tell someone else where you're going to ride so if you get in trouble um and when you expect to be back. So if you get in some trouble and you're not back on time, people will know some idea where to look for you. 
Uh, it's a good idea to kind of pay attention to where you are on the trail, even if you're following someone else, um, just to kind of get your bearings and recognize things like different trees or where a creek comes to the trail or where you make a crossing, what it looks like. This will help you know where to tell people to find you if you have a problem. Um, they're gonna talk a little later about using <clears throat> uh, a GPS um, on the trail. It's nice, there are lots of apps and she's gonna mention several later. Also, if you know where you're going um, and a trail map is, is available, it's a good idea to get a trail map because it frequently will help you know where you are and get you to a uh, place uh, or show you where to find other trails that may adjoin and help you understand where you want to go for the day. Whatever you do, stay on designated trails. Don't go off trail. Um, for instance, in the National Forest, it's illegal in uh, most areas to go off trail and just wander through the woods. It's very important to, to stay on the trails marked for horses. Don't go on trails that are designated hikers and bikers or ATVs um, at, at ever because they, you don't want them riding on your trails and th they certainly don't want you riding on theirs. When you're on, on rough surfaces or going through creeks or muddy areas, go slowly so that you're safe in case the horse trips or falls or gets a foot stuck in the mud. Also, I'd like to make a point here about muddy spots in the trails. In our national forest, we have a lot of muddy places on the trails. And um, a lot of people's horses don't like to go through mud. This is really important to try to teach your horse to go through mud because when you go around mud, it widens the spot, holds more water and makes it worse. Um, crossing rivers and creeks, um, do that in designated areas because if you don't, it can be slippery and more dangerous. Putting borium on your shoes is good in our country and, for instance, in central Kentucky, where we ride in uh, the national, northern end of the, of the Daniel Boone National Forest, we have a lot of rocks in the creeks and horses without borium or some sort of borium stud are highly likely to slip. Never ride off and leave another rider, whether you're just a group of two or more, always stay together in a group. Ride at the same level as the most inexperienced person. And I think this is one of the most important, I think the most important things that any group should be attuned to. You should always ride at the person that's at the level of the person of least experience or the person with a very, very green young horse. Always consider that the level uh, or that'll dictate your speed and where you go. Keep horses at one horse's length apart. That's easiest gauged in my opinion by looking through your horse's ears and being able to see the heels of the horse in front of you, not to the side of your horse's head, but through your horse's ears is about a horse's length apart. If you can see the heels of the horse in front of you. Um, when you're riding uphill, kind of lean a little forward so that you, your body is vertical to the horizon. And when riding downhill, you lean back slightly, again, keeping your body horizontal to what would be the horizon. Don't allow horses to touch <laughs> noses. Uh, this can create squealing and striking and issues. And it's also a health issue between horses 
because one horse could be carrying a, a bit of a disease and not necessarily be sick. If a rider needs to stop, the whole group should stop. Even if a horse stops to poop or pee, well, poop doesn't take very long. And personally, I think part of leave no trace, which will also come later, you should teach your horse to walk while pooping because it spread, spreads the poop out and other users, the, it will biodegrade faster and other users will be le less bothered by it because it will be there uh, a less of a time. Uh, be very aware of how horses perceive other horses and other people such as hikers, bikers, um, and pack backpackers. Um, I have a mule that does not like backpackers, especially in the fog and with the pack above their head. So that just be aware and try to desensitize your horses to things that they might see on the trails. Um, Horses see bikers coming at them as a predator, such as a mountain lion leaping at them from the front. It's terrifying. So another reason not to ride on somebody else's trail and to be alert to what may, may be coming. And in such cases, everybody should stop and everybody should yield appropriate. Lee. Bikers yield to hikers and both groups are supposed to yield to the horse person. Um, if you should find yourself in a situation where you feel you are lost, contact emergency management with your cell phone, which I might add should be on your person. If you have cell service, stay where you are search crews will be able to find you more easily if you stay put. If you have a rider in your group that's having trouble controlling their horse, give them space, stay out of their way. And if you're in a group, of course, as mentioned before, the whole group should stop. That pretty much covers what I have to say this evening. Well, Thank you, Edith. Uh, if you guys have any questions, like I said, we're just gonna touch on the most important items um, for, this pro for this project and we have the guidelines, uh, but the speakers that we have here tonight will not mind to answer any specific questions that you may have, okay? So you can send them to me and I can send it to them. So our next speaker is going to be uh, Ginny Groke. She is going to be talking to us about trail etiquette. Can you hear me? I better turn my video on. Okay, can you hear me, everyone? Yes? Yes, yeah, okay. Um, so trail etiquette, um, actually Edith and I were talking this morning because a lot of what she said and mine overlap a lot. So there's some things I actually might uh, skip. Actually, I see if I can, um, let me see if I can share my screen. Well, let's see, hold on a second. <laughs> wasn't quite ready for this. Okay, hold on. Uh, I would like to share my screen. Well, I won't do that. Sorry. Never mind. We won't do that. Um, so really trail etiquette, in my opinion, is basically giving other riders and hikers you know, and bikers you can share your screen now. Somehow it got dropped of the co-host. I don't know if there's a limit for co-hosts. So you can okay, share. Let's see. Yeah. So then I have to pick. Uh, it's not showing the screen I want to I want to share. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I can send this to you all. It's just a Word document. And it's very short. Um, Basically, um, tra trail etiquette is um, consideration for other people and also for the land itself. So a lot of these things, even though we do them and they result in safety for everyone, it also is consideration for not putting someone else in a situation they don't wanna be in um, or they're scared or they're angry or whatever. So that's a lot of the rules in trail etiquette have to do with that. So um, I'm gonna start with just the, the land we ride on. It'll either be private or public. And of course on private land, make sure you have permission. Um, that's very important to do. 
um, on public land in, in Kentucky, we have about four large uh, federal lands, which is the Daniel Boone National Forest, Mammoth Cave National Park, Land Between the Lakes, um, uh, Land Between the Lakes National Recreational Area, and I said four, didn't I? What am I missing? I guess maybe we have three. Three. <laughs> um, and those, of course, if you haven't been to Land Between the Lakes, there's like a hundred, hundreds of miles there. Mammoth Cave, I think, has something around 50. And Daniel Boone, I don't know what the current number is. Um, we, I am in central Kentucky, so we ride the northern end. In, uh, make sure that in the national forest, especially that you obey any closure signs, Daniel Boone National Park uh, Forest closes certain trails during the winter because of the mud situation. So what we don't wanna do is ignore the closure signs, go around them and ride anyway and say, oh, the heck with that. Um, it, we wanna have a good relationship with those land managers and be good citizens. Um, of course, there's also county parks, um, state parks. There's a Bureau of Land Management, although we don't have too much of that here in Kentucky. Army Corps of Engineers has land that goes on waterways and then Kentucky Fish and Wildlife has um, fish and wildlife property. And there's a few of those that horses are allowed on. So um, as far as speed, Edith talked about going um, at the rate of the most inexperienced rider. Um, and um, if you have a problem where you have such a diverse set of kids, you know, if you can, if you have enough adults, break into two groups. I mean, take more of a beginner group and a more an advanced group. Sometimes that helps. Oh, awesome, man. Huh? Oh, shit. What? Um, manure, we, we want to put manure where it should be. So at the trailhead where you park your trailer, um, if your horse goes to the bathroom, you know, as he's tied to the side of the trailer while you're tacking up or as he gets out of the trailer, go ahead and take a little pitchfork and toss it in the woods or, or just get it out of the way. Um, we want to leave a neat, you know, trailhead where we, where we are. Um, and it might be noted that if anybody has any other uh, hikers or bikers that say manure is dirty and fill it full with disease, there are no diseases that horses carry that can be transmitted by manure. So none that are harmful to humans. Um, so it really isn't a problem. It's more of a, oh, my howler says I'm, I've got a timer and he says I'm done already. <laughs> okay, lunch stops. If you stop uh, to rest on the trail or have lunch, never tie your horses directly to a tree with just one rope because as you know, horses chew trees. Um, so what we do is if you could take along a lead rope and maybe another rope and almost cross tie them between two trees so that they they can't reach either tree to chew on the bark because that will kill the trees. And never tie, of course, by the reins or the bit. For water crossings, um, uh, as Edith said, go across where it's designated to go across. There will be horses, inexperienced horses, that do not want to go across the water. And so it's really a good opportunity to do some training. So please be patient and allow people with you who have horses that aren't used to water, allow them to go through a little bit of training with the water and help them get the horse across. Also, as far as drinking, always offer your horse a drink at the water and never leave before everybody has had a chance to offer their horse a drink. Because a lot of horses, most horses, they want to drink, but if all the buddies are leaving, they're going to just run up the hill. They're not going to drink. And so you want them to drink. Uh, leave no trace. Leave No Trace is um, uh, a whole principle, a whole theory, and I don't have time to go into it since I'm already out of time, but uh, basically it's leave, take, you know, pack in what you, pack out what you take in. So don't leave evidence that you were there. If, you know, no candy wrappers, no pop cans, you know, try and put your manure off to the side of the trail. So do the best you can to take care of the, trail so it looks like you weren't even there. Um, interaction with other trail users. Edith mentioned the triangle, who yields to who's. A lot of people don't know that triangle. They don't know who's supposed to yield to who. So what we've always tried to do is engage people, uh, whether they're hikers or bikers, talk to them, 
explain to them, you know, how to act um, so that the horses won't be scared. Man, fuck this Zoom class. Shut your bitch ass. I was up the fuck out of this whole fucking week. Nigga, 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 nigga. I gotta go Bible study, man. So, I gotta go Bible study. <laughs> so, um, uh, so do engage other people. Let them know horse people are friendly people and we do want to help. And last but not least, I added this myself, but if you can, and I think this is especially good for kids, try to incorporate into your trail program a service component. In other words, we all want to ride trails, but we need to take care of them. So either do a trail maintenance day yourself with a group or join a group that's going to schedule a trail maintenance day so you can do some trail maintenance. Because it's kind of like a kid saying, I want to ride a horse, I want to have a horse, but I don't want to... Uh, clean the stall and I don't want to pick out their feet because it's dirty and messy. That's kind of not, you know, that's not right. Um, same with trails. You want to ride the trails, you should take care of them. And that's a good lesson to learn when they're young. And um, that's all I have for trail etiquette. Thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, so apparently there are some kids that because this link was only sent uh to you people to the leaders and the agents i don't know how this kid got in but i'm trying to kick them out as they become so now i don't know there's an any rich that was wanting to come in i don't know if i should accept because i kicked the one and then another one came in with a different name i think any is gonna have to not be in because i don't even know who she is uh the next speaker is going to be uh kim hornsby and she's going to be talking about tech and equipment all right, so I'll be kind of quick with this part because the second part that I'm talking about is a little bit longer. But uh, first of all, you know, with any tack and equipment, we just want to make sure that it is safe. Um, and I'll talk about the saddles first. It can be Western or English. It does not matter. Uh, a lot of people ride endurance saddles. There are all types of different saddles that people ride, and that is completely fine. Um, it, the main thing is that it has a proper fit. Um, and then also a, a nice thing for a, a trail saddle to have is some rings to tie to. So I thought it was kind of a little tip that I would give everybody. Um, as far as the bridle, um, it's good good for the trail bridles to have a throat latch, especially if you're going to go on long rides. Usually the, a lot of times the one ears, they'll shake their head, it flies and those can come off. And, and of course, you know, the proper bit, um, something the, that the horse is very comfortable with and that the rider is able to manage the horse. Um, you can you can put a halter underneath the underneath the bridle, of course, and um, you know that that's definitely an option that that a lot of people do choose to use. And um, you know if they do need to stop and tie up, and uh, like Jenny said, you know it's not good to tie the trees, so you could you could get just a little high line or picket line if you're going to have to be tying up. Um, the saddle pad is a really important part. Um, you know probably if you're riding maybe an English type saddle or a or um, an endurance type saddle, you may not have to get as thick of a pad, but a lot of the Western saddles do require a thicker pad, especially for longer rides. Um, I really like the contoured pads. Um, those seem to help hold the saddle in place a little bit better, especially, you know, depending on how the horse is made. Um, and then I, I really do like the wool pads as well. Those, those seem to, those have really done well with, for me in the past. Um, but, you know, you, you may be able to get, you know, other types of synthetic pads as well. So um, cinches, uh, those are good um, as far as, as finding a cinch in any type of um, natural fibers is good. Uh, I especially like the mohair cinches or the alpaca cinches. Those are, those are really good, especially for the longer rides. Um, and then, of course, accessories. Um, they make all types of different saddle bags. It just depends on how long they're going to be in the saddle. You know, they may want to pack a, a lunch or some of them maybe even, you know, try an overnight trip um, in the future. But uh, definitely on, on the trails here in Eastern Kentucky, I know, um, and some of the ones that I've been on out in Western Kentucky as well, it's a good idea to have a breast collar um, that, fits, that fits the horse. And then um, on some of the trails or, or for different horses, um, or mules, some kids, some of the kids are going to be riding mules, a crupper, a crupper or breeching. And so 
uh, or they call it a bridge in, uh, in some places too. And those just fit around um, either the, the britchins fit around the back of the horse's hindquarters or the mule's hindquarters and then the crupper goes, slides under the tail. So if they do use those, just make sure that that's something that the horses or mule or that they're used to it. And um, that'll keep the saddle from sliding forward. And just like the breast collar would keep the saddle from, um, from sliding back. Uh, proper fitting tack is a must. It prevents galls, rubs, um, saddle sores. And, you know, if, if they get out there on the trail for three or four hours on their horse after they get them conditioned and um, they get, you know, uh, they, they may become very uncomfortable if their saddle doesn't fit them correctly and they may not want to trail ride anymore. So we, we don't want that. Just make sure that their saddle fits them and the horse good. Um, you know, it's important to check the wear of the tack uh, before and after each ride. The you know leather does have a tendency to dry rot and crack over over time, especially if you have you know with a lot of sweat, and um, so it's just really important that you you check that, especially you know the the billets um, anywhere that that it attaches is usually a, a wear point. A lot of friction that happens there, so bridles, saddles, um, everything needs to be checked really well before you ride. Uh, and, and after, and then, uh, you know, if you catch it after it, after the ride, then that, that allows you to be prepared and make sure that you're not like trying to get on the horse and then you realize that something's broke and then, you know, so just make sure that you check both. Um, tack should be clean and free of debris. And what happens with that is if there, there's a lot of sweat marks or if there's any kind of debris or dirt, um, that will rub the horse up and then it'll make, you know, just, a, it'll make them uncomfortable and then they, you know, may get sour, not want to ride. Um, it's important to check the horse for rubs after each ride and then all straps and cinches need to lie flat against the horse. It just needs to be um, snug and secure, but not tight to the point where it's uncomfortable. Um, and I always try to tell everybody, you know, cinch placement, even though it does depend on the rigging of the saddle, um, it just doesn't need to be placed right underneath the elbow. I've seen a lot of horses get rubbed up that way. So um, and that is my time is up and I am done. So we can go on to the next person. Thank you, Kim. Um, okay, our next speaker is going to be uh, Bernice Embergay. And I have, Bernice, do you want me to start sharing your slides now? Bernice? Yes, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> yes, I'm ready. So this section is uh, covers choosing the right trail horse. I know a lot of us leaders and parents and some of the 4-H kids we have already have their own horse. So this information can be used um, to help evaluate their horse or make sure if they're looking to purchase a new horse, they can have this information. So hopefully it will help. Um, Sorry, hold on just a second. I had a problem here with this light. I chose to do a PowerPoint. <laughs> well, you wouldn't have to look at me the whole time. <laughs> there we go. Can you guys see it? Yes, I can see yes. it. Okay. Yes. So when we're lo when looking for a good trail horse, the good news is that uh, trail horses come in all sizes, breeds, colors, and shapes. Trail horses can be tall or lean like a thoroughbred or a Tennessee walking horse or short and stocky like quarter horses, Mustangs or the mountain saddle horses we have a lot in our area. But a good horse simply is any animal that will safely take you down all types of terrain and all types of trail conditions. Okay. A few of the key characteristics or traits to keep in mind when choosing or evaluating your trail horse. Next slide, Fernanda. Or I don't know, can I, re can I um, advance them? All right, there we go. So disposition, attitude, confirmation, soundness, age, gender, and trail experience. Disposition or temperament is you really want a calm, relaxed, laid back horse. A quiet horse is one that will put up with a lot of distractions. 
You want a horse that should, that's instinctively cooperative with an easygoing nature. The horse should actually display a desire or enthusiasm to get out and explore their new environment. Intelligent horse has good instincts, will have the ability to take you down, uh, navigate uh, unfamiliar terrain. And if, most importantly, you would like a horse that doesn't spook very easy. Um, if you spend a lot of time out on the trail, eventually your horse is gonna spook at something. He may throw his head up or snort at a bag, plastic bag or something blowing by, but he won't spin or take off with running. Um, he'll think first and then react, which gives you time to calm him down, give him a quiet pat or a nudge and keep him moving. On the other hand, a nervous horse will fret and worry and they actually look for things to pop out at them. They don't usually make the best trail horses. All right, next slide. Attitude, we talk about uh, horse's attitude. We're referring to generally uh, his overall mood and personality. Um, you've all seen horses that are friendlier than others and um, ones that really want to please. Um, they need to have a willing attitude and will walk out down the trail and you won't have to keep after them. Um, one that generally likes people and other horses is a must. Uh, attitude also will dictate momentum. Um, a good trail horse has high energy and he actually is ready and he, you can tell he loves his job. Um, just point his nose up a hill and he'll pick up the best trail up through the rocks. He's respectful and his whole body language will demonstrate that. Attitude is ultimately how well they will do for you. Confirmation is uh, simply a correctness of bones, musculature and body proportions in relation to each other. Um, you wanna look for balance over beauty. Um, so don't rule out the horse with the Roman nose or a thick neck. Just because he may not place well in a, in a confirmation class, he can prove himself on the trail if he's worthy and safe and uh, he can carry a rider safely over narrow trails, across creeks or up steep banks or terrain. Um, uh, overall confirmation does play a role in the ability of the horse to perform. A short backed horse um, will be able to carry more weight, but a uh, uh, short coupled horse, horse with long legs, they may actually tend to scalp uh, the front legs. Um, a horse with uh, too wide of a front chest and between his legs, he may have more power going uphill, but he may stumble more on a narrow trail. So um, and of course, good confirmation keeps uh, your horse sound longer. Obviously, a young horse won't be as trail wise, trail wise as an aged horse. And of course, the older horse should be more settled than a young horse. Um, older horses are considered uh, senior when they reach 18 to 20 years old. So how old is too old? Of course, that depends on the horse and each horse should be individually evaluated. Um, it depends on a number of things. Um, definitely their current condition, care, past history of in injuries and how long and hard you and often you will be riding him. Some may be needing to retire while some could be ridden um, lightly. Um, we've all seen some of the 20 year olds that act like two year olds. And those are the ones we call go-go horses. Um, now that I'm older and want to walk more, I got rid of my go-go horse. So uh, she's gone, gone now. Gender, since we have a no stallion policy, that leaves us, of course, with our mares and geldings. Um, everyone knows that mares are a little bit temperamental and they can display some... Uh, definite problems on the trail with other strange horses. Um, kicking, biting, pinning their ears back and trying to uh, just uh, get to another horse 
when they pass or go by or get too close. Geldings uh, obviously have a more even temperament and there are a lot of people that say they're easier to work with. Either way, um, it's a personal choice and if the horse is friendly uh, to other horses and people while under, under saddle, both can make a good trail mount. Soundness uh, is the horse sound. Um, the definition is basically is a condition in which a horse is able to do work that's asked of it without undue stress or injury. Well, it seems like a simple uh, definition. It represents actually a complex interaction between um, confirmation, fitness, uh, mechanics in motion, how, how well he moves, uh, it's mental and temperament uh, characteristics, basically it's overall state of wellness. Uh, scars and blemishes um, usually don't affect um, the horse uh, soundness. Um, they can, some can be corrected and some can be permanent. So I think the main thing here is we want to concentrate on how to keep your horse sound. And we can do this through good management. Um, there are several things. Uh, proper nutrition. You want to maintain a healthy weight for your horse. Extra weight we know puts uh, stress on joints. Um, trimming and foot care. We want to try to stick to a regular schedule. Uh, some six to eight weeks, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on how fast your horse's feet grow. Um, uh, Kim talked about the fit and comfort of your tack. You need to watch that because there can be uh, galls, saddle sores, and rubs. So uh, also choose uh, a horse that is appropriate for the size of the rider. Ideal max weight for a horse is 20% of their body weight to carry. So a thousand pound horse can carry 200 pounds and that includes the rider and the tack. Uh, other things uh, you can do is constant uh, or daily checks, weekly, whatever it fits into your schedule if you're riding all the time to check your horse, quick body check to see if there's any other problems that you can catch quickly. Um, inflammation of a joint or tendon, uh, any trouble breathing. Um, catch them before, when they're minor before they become a major problem and they'll usually heal up quicker. There's also a couple other things I wanted to note. You can warm up your horse a little bit before going out on the trail, just like us when we're uh, doing exercises, you need to warm up. Also, if you can, turn your horse out as much as possible. Um, in general, they're better um, with the fresh air, healthier with more room to, to run. And uh, also, it's a great to run off extra energy. All right, so evaluating your horse with, uh, to make sure he has trail experience. Next slide, yeah, there we go. Um, trail horses aren't necessarily bred for trail riding. They're educated. So to safely uh, carry you in all kinds of situations, the more experience your horse has outdoors, the better on the trails, the better he will be. Um, the less, and the less experienced you are as a rider, the more experienced your trail mount should be. Um, Arena horses uh, may have trouble at first adjusting to this, but uh, if you get them out there and work with them, start something easy first, um, maybe a flat trail ride through the woods and, and maybe a creek and work up to something more with uh, more steep and difficult terrain. They'll usually come into it as long as um, they have the good basic skills and ground manners. They'll stand for you, they'll move out for you. They'll let you get on and off easily. Um, so as long as you can work with them and train them, they can make a good trail horse as well. So even if you have um, an experienced horse, like we talked about, they will and can still spook. 
But the most important thing to do is to remember in these situations um, is how they react and how quick they will calm down and if he trusts you. So which leads us into our next slide, the importance of building that relationship between you and your horse. Um, when on the trail, the horse should easily go where directed and largely it depends on this relationship that you build with your horse. If you're firm but respectful, the horse will trust your judgment. And at first he may hesitate. And when you ask him to go on to um, down a hill or in a creek terrain that he has not been familiar with. But once he learns that you'll keep him out of danger, you'll start gaining his trust and you'll start uh, actually getting more confidence in your abilities to ride them as well. Um, sometimes the horse will stop and want to take another route. Um, sometimes that means he's not refusing you, but maybe he has uh, perceived something's just not right and he will pick out his own path. And that way he'll also um, keep you both safe. And again, the mutual trust between you and your horse is what you want to try to build. And the more you saddle up and ride, the better you'll be together. So let's get out on those trails and ride. Is there any questions? Um, Fernanda said you can um, post them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, hold on, because what happened here? Come back. Hold on. I had to minimize everything. I, I lost my um, schedule. Okay, who is next? Next is how to condition the horse physically and mentally. And we're going to have Kim speak again. And just so you guys know, we have... Um, we have, um, Dr. Lawrence and I are creating a, a fact sheet on how to prepare your horse for, um, to condition your horse physically for uh, trail riding and long distance riding. So it's coming soon. So you're gonna see on the guidelines, there's gonna be multiple parts that are going to be, um, are going to be what? Highlighted and it's because these things are coming soon. Okay, so what Kim is gonna talk about now conditioning them physically and mentally. All right, so Bernice talked about a lot of this in her in her slides. She did a great job going through some of these things, but uh, she mentioned forming, forming a partnership before you ever take your horse out on the first ride, you know, spending that time grooming, uh, doing, doing some groundwork, doing a lot of riding at home, just exposing them to all kinds of stimulus, anything that you can think of that might scare them or spook them. Not, not you know, not scaring them intentionally, but exposing them to things that will um, help them get used to what they might see on, out on the trail ride. And then uh, I think this was from uh, Dr. Camargo had mentioned this, good training is as important as good conditioning for fitness as a horse can use up a lot of physical energy coping with emotional stress. So we've all seen the horses that, you know, are just, are just really nervous and tense and they, they end up using up a lot of their energy um, on that tension. So if we can get them focused on us, of course, um, mentally by doing some groundwork, uh, here are just a few things that I thought would be good to include that, you know, they can work on at home, being able to stand for mounting and dismounting, uh, leading quietly, and then going off of the, um, off of the handler's um, suggestions for that, uh, backing up, tying, uh, just working on the focus of the horse, making sure they're paying attention to the handler, and then lots of desensitizing, and then, uh, you know, just set up some simple obstacles on the ground, make sure that they're ready to go over those. Uh, for mounted work, um, they should be able to stop with your seat, a verbal cue, and a gentle pull on the reins. So if you're, if they're having to, you know, just really pull back hard on the reins, then, you know, that's, they need to do some more transitions with them and try to get them to where they will respond to that more readily. Um, standing quietly after stopping, you know, I see a lot of people that they, when they stop their horse, they, the horse wants to continue going. So they're, they're, they're having to hold that horse instead of when you stop your horse, you should be able to just kind of, you know, loosen up on the reins and, and let that horse stand there and relax. And a lot of them won't do that. So that's something that they need to work on with them. 
um, going forward willingly, uh, you know, with just a squeeze or a cluck and then turning left and right, lots of desensitizing under saddle as well. And then of course, working on some obstacles under saddle at home will help to prepare them for anything they might see on the trail. Um, it's important to know your horse. Um, physical conditioning is also important. And so just making sure that the horse is, is conditioned for the right, you know, for the speed, distance and terrain that you're gonna be riding on. Um, you know how fast the people that you ride with go. Um, if they go, if they have a tendency to trot and canter a lot, or if they're riding gated horses and they like to step them up and, and you know, speed down the trail a little bit faster, then of course there's gonna be some more condition invo involved with that than just flat walk. Um, just making sure that you start with a sound and healthy horse is important. Um, a lot of people use retired horses and that's great, but just making sure that none of them have, um, you know, that, that they don't have um, issues that may um, show up later or that they've, you know, they've been retired because of a, a severe injury or something and making sure that you adapt your riding habits to that horse's physical ability. Uh, checking the resting heart rate, uh, pulse, uh, respiratory rate, temperature, how, you know, feel, run your legs down your, or your hand down those legs and making sure that they, that they feel, um, you know, there's no heat in them and, and just knowing the overall demeanor and attitude of your horse to begin with before you actually start putting on the trail. And then that will help you identify problems as they come up. Um, any kind of abnormal behavior due to foot pain, saddle fit, muscle pain, illness, or a variety of reasons. And then just be sure to schedule a visit with your vet with tell, you know, if, if they're having a problem with their horse and they're not able to determine why that that horse is doing something like, let's say they start bucking or they start bolting and that's not a typical behavior. It could be from pain. So we want to make sure we encourage them to do that. Um, feeding, uh, the diet is, it's important. And, you know, all horses need a balanced diet of hay, um, pasture concentrate or ration balancer, um, depending on the lifestyle, you know, hard keepers need, they need higher, higher calories. They need a lot more, um, calories than, than the ones that get, you know, get fat on grass. Um, but easy keepers do well on a ration balancer. Um, which, you know, maybe you can, uh, that can be adjusted as, as athletic performance increases. So as you start riding more, you can, you can adjust that. Um, if a horse is losing weight, it, it may be because it's being ridden too hard, or it just could be that the, the diet is not proper for that horse. Um, and of course, you know, there's all, all kinds of other things too that could be going on, but those are two common problems, um, or, you know, teeth or, or um, it could be some kind of other illness, but um, if the horse starts to lose weight, then, uh, and Dr. Camargo has a great video on this on the 4-H um, YouTube channel, and it's, um, if, if they start to lose weight, uh, ride less frequently or with less intensity and feed him more until he's of an optimum uh, body score. And so there's a, there's a good, she has actually two or three good videos about um, uh, body scores and then uh, putting weight on a, a, a thin horse and then um, also, um, what to do if your horse is too fat. <laughs> and uh, so another thing that we want to think about in conditioning um, the horse is to make sure that, you know, their feet are in good shape. Of course, if they're going to be riding on the trails for miles, it's really important to make sure that they are, um, uh, their feet are, are cared for properly. So building a good relationship with the vet and farrier, um, regular shoeing and trimming and then of course proper proper nutrition is important um there are some supplements on the market that that are pretty good for for uh, hooves and they and also they will grow faster as the horses exercise because of the increased circulation so unless they're being worn down faster than they're growing um and you know if they have shoes on of course they'll that'll keep them from wearing down uh, uh first long uh, first phase of, of physical condition is uh, just going to make sure that we go long and slow and and to make sure that um, we're if we're preparing a novice horse or a young horse or a horse that's sedentary it hasn't been ridden um, it's you know been in the stall for a while uh, ride that horse three to five times a week allow about 12 weeks to get him physically fit uh, start about 20, 30 minutes a day and then start to increase that by about five minutes per ride just to make sure that um, they can be comfortably ridden for about an hour. And then active horses on turnout um, may take less less time than sedentary horses in the stall. So, um, you know, those that are out in the pasture may not have to be, they may not take as long to come along. Um, initial rides can be done in a field, easy trails or a mixture, and then 
just making sure that you're riding inclines gradually because those inclines can really cause injury if they are just coming back to work. In phase two, we start to increase the intensity and time um, and, you know, introduce some trotting and a faster gait or uh, and just kind of, you know, inter intermittent walking. And for older retired sedentary horses, trotting should be, real, you know, just take time, take your time with them, make sure that you're going slow with that. Um, learn to post the trot instead of just being de dead weight in the saddle. That way you're not hurting their back. Um, and of course, if, if the tack is not fitting properly, that can cause a lot of soreness through the horse's back as well. And then, as I mentioned earlier, they do end up getting to the point to where they can get kind of sour or, you know, not enjoy their ride. And we don't want that for sure. Uh, just continue to increase that trotting time um, and then add some cantering um, and introduce some heel work and, you know, start diagonally at first and then increase to the trot it, um, up and down hills. Of course, we've got all kinds of hills here in Kentucky to ride up and down. Um, and then downhill work, um, it's important that you're doing this at a walk because the front legs carry the, uh, the majority of the concussion. And so um, the um, as you're conditioning, you don't want to start trotting downhill because it can be a, that can be a lot for them. Uh, just in, continue to increase the distance and time that you spend moving out of the faster gate. Um, always include a warm up and a cool down in your ride. And uh, pay, this is an important one, pay close attention to saddle fit because as your horse gets more fit, the saddle will, will change um, the way that it fits. So, you know, you may need to do some, some different things with that. Um, a horse can become fit fast, but the tissues do not condition as quickly as the, the horse a lot of times. So it's kind of hard to tell. So you've got to really be careful about, you know, those tendons and everything. Um, it could take three to four months to, per, to prepare a horse that's out of shape to go on a four to six hour trail ride. And then um, phase three, just maintaining that fitness. It's important that you ride routinely. Uh, the musculoskeletal system, tendons, ligaments, uh, cardiovascular respiratory system, it takes longer to condition than it takes to weaken. So they get out of shape quicker than they get in shape. <laughs> Um, conditioning the horse physically, cross training. Um, heels are important for training. Um, you want to develop those hind quarters, uh, you know, letting your horse canter, go faster on flat portions of the trail with safe footing if you can. Um, you know, it's kind of like interval training, uh, walk, trot, canter, and, you know, kind of go back in between, uh, go between them. Um, changing your pace and scenery that keeps everything fresh, that keeps your horse alert and enjoying what they're doing. And then if you don't have access to heels, you know, consider some um, ground poles or cavalettis or trailer out to the trails with steeper heels. Um, and that will kind of help prepare them. Rest is as important as conditioning, um, building energy, storage, and regenerates the repairs and, and repairs the muscle fiber or other tissues that become inflamed. Um, it's just as important for them to rest as it is for us to have a little rest. So if you're in phase one, you know, it's mostly walking, you, they don't need as much rest. But if you're in phase two and the intensity has increased, you'll need to allow the horse to rest and recover more frequently. And they do need at least one full day of rest per week. Um, if, and if they are, if no rest or recovery is allowed, the body is unable to regenerate the tissues and it'll break down. And so that is when you really start to see a lot of injuries happen and, you know, they'll be laid off for a while. So it's best to just prevent that from happening. All right. Is that it? Kim? That is it. Yep. Okay. So now we are going to have Edith and Jen uh, talking about uh, how to prepare yourself for trail riding. Uh, this is going to be um, like Jen like and Edith, like a conversation between the two of you. So Edith does this all the time. So does Jen. Uh, and how do you keep yourselves fit? So nothing like hurts, etc. So this is what we want to know. Okay, I made a little PowerPoint. Can you guys see it? I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? We can, yes. Okay, um, but I'm happy to share too, so with my companion. Um, I'm from the University of Connecticut. Um, Fernanda asked me to come and talk today. I actually teach a trail practicum class at the University of Connecticut where my students and I ride out on the trails. It's part of our equine program at UConn. 
Um, so like you already said, you want to make sure you check your tack, your saddle and your bridle, make sure that nothing is dysfunctional because that is the worst time in the world to find out. And, um, I know one time I was like out riding and uh, another kid had been riding my horse and we swapped horses in the middle. Cause I, I needed to have my trip, my lead horse back and my bridle fell off because the student did not secure the throat latch. So you always want to check your tack very carefully. Cause that luckily I was riding a good horse who stopped immediately when I asked her, but if that didn't happen, that could have been a bad day. Um, and then like you were already saying, Kimberly, thank you very much. Uh, properly fitting the tack is so important, right? We don't want to have any issues. Also think about leg protection. Um, there are pros and cons to that because like if you're going across creeks and things like that, that you know, it's going to get wet. So that is a consideration. But um, I know like on our trails, we have a lot of rocks and we have a lot of sticks that poke the horses. And sometimes like when I didn't put leg protection on, the horses would come back like, you know, with little gashes and stuff like that, just tiny little nicks. But we always um, put boots on now, um, just not boots, but like a little uh, sport boot uh, for protection of their legs. And that seems to work pretty well. Um, but like polo wraps can become an issue as you know, cause you don't want them to like unravel in the middle of your ride. Cause that's not very fun. Another thing is probably it would be best if you could avoid putting horses in a martingale or tie down on the trail. It just restricts their movement. It's one of the reasons that like eventers don't allow martingales and tie downs like in eventing uh, courses because if a horse is to trip or something, it can be difficult for them to regain themselves if they don't have full use of their head. So we don't allow people to go out with a martingale or tie down at Yukon um, with our horses. And they do just fine actually. Um, and then, like you already said, breast collar, breaching or tail cropper, depending on the horse, they may need those things. I know one of my horses, you can't ride him without a breast collar or, or breastplate because he'll just like lose the saddle. Um, so that's pretty key. And then also think about like fly bonnets because I don't know about in Kentucky, but we have these really pesky flies in Connecticut that are just obnoxious and go right in the horse's ears and drive them berserk. So we usually put a fly bonnet on them um, for that. And then um, it's a good idea to have first aid knowledge as a rider, like at least have someone in your party that has some idea of first aid knowledge. You could see my little first aid kit that I like carry here. Um, just so that you know like what to do in case the situation arises because we can be pretty far from help. So it's a good idea like to know what to do in case that happens. So um, in my little pocket, I have like one pocket that's for riders and the other side has horse stuff in it. Um, so we, and we always talk about that at 4-H um, giddy up games and things like that. Make sure you have a hoof pick too in case something gets in the horse's hoof so that you could get that out or maybe like a multi-purpose knife. Um, remember, like I think someone who was talking about safety earlier, that was really good how you were mentioning like, you know, always, if you have a cell phone, make sure it's not on the horse, make sure like it's on your person. Um, they actually have those really cool little belts that runners use that you can put around you and they, ho they hold all size cell phones. Cause they keep, I don't know if you've noticed, but they keep making cell phones like larger and larger and larger. Um, but they still are able to accommodate those. Um, you might want to consider bringing a lead rope or having a horse wear a halter underneath or a bridle that detaches from the bits so that if you have to tie your horse in an emergency, you have that. Um, it's not a bad idea to carry a flashlight either in case for some reason you're stuck out after dark. Um, here's some different things for the first aid kit for the rider, but I know you have all of this stuff online just Fernanda asked me to cover what to be prepared. So it's just your basic first aid items, maybe some aspirin. Um, you know, non-latex gloves, um, scissors, gauze pads, um, tweezers, removing those ticks. Um, but we usually, we'd probably wait till we got back to do that. Any kind of thing to wrap up like a cut or something that we might run across. Um, disposable diapers are good too. Um, some sort of disinfectant um, and like a spare halter. Talk about that. Um, also our um, wire cutters maybe if you're going to be riding where you think there's wire we actually have wire wire like buried out in our forest which I just try to know where that is and avoid those areas but you want to be aware of things like that and then um, you also want to make sure for the rider you know you have your rain gear if you're going to need it um, it's a really good idea to wear sunscreen because, you know, we know that a lot of people are getting sunburned and it's causing like damage to them. So encouraging the youth that you're with to, you know, bring their sunscreen or wear their sunglasses to help protect their eyes against macular degeneration. We don't always think of that, but it is really important. Um, insect repellent, you know, I find that usually the, the flies and things attack the horse more than they do the person. 
but making sure you do that. Another good thing is that insect repellent that we use also repels ticks. So making sure you spray along their belly and things. And I would even do that in the fall um, so that when ticks are out, you can repel them. <coughs> also um, a map and compass, like you talked about earlier, if you're gonna be going on a long ride, make sure you have a snack for those youth and some water. Um, some people like to ride in gloves. So, and if you're gonna be doing trail maintenance, that might not be a bad idea either. Um, and we already talked about the horse being properly conditioned. Um, you can take the horse's pulse and respiration rate before and after the ride. That might be a fun thing to do with the youth so that they get practice in doing the pulse and the respiration rate. And then you can teach them about, you know, looking for the horse to have recovered. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of the success in the saddle video series, but the lady in that always says she's a um, USDF judge, Debbie Rodriguez. And she always says, don't let your horse be the only athlete. Train yourself for success in the saddle. And she actually has a trail horse um, in the video um, as part of it. Like she, she does other things too. Um, but it's not a bad idea for the rider to also be fit, not just have our horses be the only athletes. And like you already talked about, really important to have the horse be behaviorally suited. I know I have a, a new lead horse right now that's easing into his job and it makes for a little more exciting ride than it has in the past when I had my dead broke horse that they sold on me during the pandemic. But story for another day. Um, these are some other things that you might find interesting. There's a trail riding 101 short course if you're into it that's on My Horse University. And then Stacy Westfall's Ride Safely on the Trail is also another one. This is a picture of Horse Barn Hill. We actually have a lot of casualties up here because the horses see this wide open space and we run up this hill and that's where everyone gets bucked off. So <laughs> it makes for, I don't take people there too much anymore. And I hope I did not hog that. If anyone else wants to say anything about that, I am sorry. I went off on my tangent. There we go. That's all good. I was going to ask Edith. Thanks, Jan. Um, I was going to ask Edith. Edith, how do you keep yourself physically fit to go to? And I know that you and Ginny, uh, do these long trips and trail ride and like stay on the saddle for hours and hours and hours. How do you do this? Because I ride for one hour and I'm dead. So, yes, but you probably only have time to ride for one hour every day. I have time to ride for five minutes. So I ride seven, <laughs> one hour is a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> riding, <clears throat> Uh, there are lots of things th that help, like yoga or Pilates or just exercising uh, at a gym, but they don't exercise the muscles that you need for riding. And one of the best ways to get fit riding is to ride. And um, people, for instance, like I would guess you, if you only ride for five minutes or an hour at any one time, if you go out for two hours, your butt and your thighs and your arms, everything is going to hurt the next day. <laughs> so pretty much, um, I, pretty much I do keep myself fit by just riding. I'm now so old that my whole body just sort of knows what it's doing. And I rarely get sore even if I haven't ridden for a week or, or months even. Um, but it, it, it is, uh, I mean, I do also farm. So that's walking a lot. And, uh, you know, I'll put in two or three miles a day just farming and walking helps a lot. Um, and, th and then just like was just like getting a horse fit, you get yourself fit the same way by while you're getting your horse fit, you get yourself fit by shorter rides and then lengthening the rides and then going on different terrain until pretty soon you find you can ride as long as you want. That is really a good, like the thing about that video that I mentioned, I mean, I like, I don't get any royalties from this, but I just want to say like, it does talk about like the different rider muscles that you're working when you do it. And it's, it works on your core fitness. And I mean, I feel it like I'm a sedentary professor, not like, <laughs> not like our friend here. Um, so <laughs> unfortunately um, I need that video <laughs> to like kick my butt into shape. Um, and it really does a good job. So I mean, I, like I say, I don't get any royalties, but I do think that's like a good one if you do want to check it out. Dan, would you mind putting that link on the chat here for the video just so every, so we have? Um... Yeah, I'll do that. I'll look it up right now. Okay. All right. So the next one to speak is going to be Sarah Coleman. She is the executive director for the Kentucky Horse Council. 
And uh, she's going to talk about trails in Kentucky. So we have Jeannie Groke here. She's the former executive director of the Kentucky Horse Council. And we have Sarah, because we in 4-H uh, and the University of Kentucky, we work with the Horse Council very, very tightly. So um, I want to encourage you all, first of all, to become a member of the Kentucky Horse Council. The kids, and I don't know, I may speak, be speaking out of, uh, out of turn here, Sarah, but they were going to work to see if the kids could become members for free. So that being said, uh, Sarah's going to talk to you all on how to find good trails. <laughs> so thank you, Fernanda. Again, my name is Sarah. It's really nice to meet you guys. So Ginny actually was the original author. Let me see if I can hold this up. There is a trail booklet that Ginny did back in 2009 that we are getting ready to revive. And this is actually lists all of the, in all honesty, she could speak to it way more than I can, uh, but it lists all the trails. And there is actually a CD with it that I just had the trail maps exported today because I have a computer without a CD drive. Um, but it includes all kinds of information in this booklet and then downloadable trail maps, which we're actually gonna put online behind a paywall, quote unquote, which the 4-H you know, agents and kids will not have to do anything clearly because you are, will be grandfathered in as members essentially. But um, we do understand that clearly when you guys are out there, you don't always have a strong internet signal. So we're going to make sure that you can download them and print them, no problem. And then Ginny was really good. We're going to base everything off of what she already did. But it basically includes some information on each of the camping sites, uh, directions, an immediate contact, and things like that. So we are working on this now. I apologize. It's not ready to go yet. We're still trying to track down contacts at each of the state parks. Okay, perfect. Uh, and if you guys uh, want to send to me also some parks that you have gone as leaders and you have felt that they were easy trails, because I know a lot of you all go out and do this, this thing. So if you can send to me, I have a list here and I, um, of some trails that somebody told. I actually had somebody come and fix my air conditioner and he was uh, a 4-H'er. He won a belt buckle in our show and he did great and he gave me some trail ideas. Uh, but I would like for you guys to, here he is, what's his name? I don't have his name. Um, yeah, I have the trail though. So the next one to be talking about is going to be uh, Jen again, uh, Nado, and she's gonna be talking about possible scenarios on the trail and just some things to do. Now we have a list on the scenarios there, Jen. Just talk about like maybe one or two or the main idea of like what to do or what not to do when you encounter, you know, more generalized maybe. Oh, okay. Oh, I did throw in, I wanted to say, cause Edith was um, sad that she didn't get the no, leave no trace principles. Or I think it was her. So these are them like plan ahead and prepare that you've talked about traveling on durable surfaces, disposing of your waste properly, leave what you find, respect wildlife, be considerate of other users, just like you were saying. Um, so one of the things that I think about, because sometimes getting to the trails can be an issue, is crossing the road. So make sure that horses are acclimated to traffic when you're going. And then if you're riding in the group, a lot of times we just have our last rider come to the front and stand on the yellow line and kind of block the road for others. That's usually my TA that you know we're doing. You see my student behind us. And then you have everyone walk straight across the road. Um, but do be prepared for crazy drivers like honking, stones flying. Um, because we know that people can be insane about that thing. Um, but when you are, when you do have to ride on, on the side of the road to get to your trail, make sure you're on the right side of the road. That's the proper sign. You're supposed to follow all the traffic rules, stop at stop signs. These are ways to signal how you're turning. It's kind of like when you're riding a bike and you want to carry a light that's visible at least 200 feet to the front and the rear if you're going at night and wear your reflective clothing. Um, some places like my town now has sharrows and this is supposed to make room for our users like horses. So that's handy if you can get your town to do that. And on the trail we want, people are supposed to yield to horses, but this seems to be something that no one knows. It seems like everyone yields to bikes and no one yields to anyone else. So this is a sign you might want to get. We put some of those up, but you know, people stole one. I don't know what's going on. Another thing you can see on the trail is dogs, right? And like sometimes I always worry that the dog is going to run up and like get under my horse's hooves and my horse is going to kick it in the head. Because I mean, how do you really stop a horse from doing that if it's really that upset? Like 
you know, we don't really control that. We hope that that won't happen. Um, so I always talk to the owners, let them know we're coming um, and try to tell them like, please put your dog on a leash or get a hold of your dog. Cause I don't want my horse to kick your, your dog. Even if I don't think my dog, my horse will do that. I still do that. Um, and then if you see any of these signs, these are signs that the dog is going to be aggressive. So give that one plenty of room. Um, so these are some different things, snarling, snapping. I'm sure you're all aware of what dogs can be like. Um, and then these are some signs of fear. So probably, again, they could turn aggressive if they're showing some signs of fear. So you wanna be aware of those. Um, and then earlier, Edith was talking about like mud and ruts. I mean, one of the things I've been trying to teach my riders at Yukon is not to go out when it's really muddy because we make really deep ruts. I mean, look at what the bikes do right here. Like, and then everyone hates us when we do that. And a thousand pound animal like makes a really deep rut. So if we can avoid riding when it's really muddy, I say that we should like try to ride on surfaces that we know. Like I know that there are some trails at Yukon that are not gonna show an impact from a horse riding when it's more wet out. But I try to avoid those that I know get muddy. If you could do that, that would be really helpful because we don't want everyone to hate us just because we ride these large animals and they can cause damage. And we all know it takes a long time for the trail to recover from that. So wet trails can really be an issue. And then the other thing to be careful of is bees. In the, um, I don't know if what it's like in Kentucky, but I know when I hiked in the Smokies, I, I'm a UK grad, by the way, 1995, animal science. Um, but I would be careful of these bees because in the summer, late summer and early fall in Connecticut, we have these ground nesting bees. And I mean, you don't always know that they're there. You could hike the trail ahead of time and until a thousand pound animal goes over it, you have no idea. So just try to be aware of where the bees might be. And then I would say like, once you find a ground nest, I would either try to eradicate it if it's possible, or I would just avoid that area until the frost because those bees are so aggressive. And when they start stinging horses, the horses bolt and run away with the people. And it's just like a bad scene. Um, so be careful of ground bees. Bridges can be an issue. Sometimes people like they, they don't always seem to use good judgment. Like they'll just go over like any bridge. I mean, if a bridge looks questionable to me, I will not ride my horse over it. Like, so make sure the bridge seems like it's safe for both you and the horse. I would not go over a bridge that you're not sure about. So try to avoid that. You already, they already, she already talked about crossing creeks, um, Edith did. And, you know, crossing creeks are, like she said, just try to use the best point of entry for the creek and, and give your horse its head to look at how deep, they don't have good depth perception. So let them pick their way carefully over it. Another thing that goes back to like the trail etiquette that we said is having a good sight line. I actually was riding my bike one day on a rail trail here in Connecticut and I saw a rider like trotting up almost on top of a runner. And I was like, that is so rude. Like, why would you do that? Like that, that's why people start to hate us because if you trot on, almost on top of a runner. I mean, that's scary, right? If you were a person walking, you wouldn't want a horse nearly trotting over top of you. So try to keep your youth and remind them like not to do things like that because it just gives us all a bad name if people do that. Um, again, make sure you have lighting um, just in case you're caught out. Um, it's not a bad idea to bring a phone. You may not have reception everywhere, but if you need um, to get reception, you at least you have a phone to call. Um, it's not a good idea really to ride alone as we have pretty much all know. I know I've been in my scenarios in my day. I don't know about bringing mace. I mean, I just put that out there. I, as long as you guys are in a group, I think you're gonna be fine. So I would not. And then what about confrontations? This was what she talked about earlier. Like, you know, you can bring up these points. People sometimes wanna fight with us. I'd rather avoid that if I can, but you can always try to educate them about these things that really, manure is just undigested plant parts. It's really not a big deal. It doesn't have cryptosporidium or giardia. It doesn't have anything. And it's excluded from solid waste regulations because it has no hazardous characteristics. And like she said, you could teach your horse to try to um, you know, poop in a, a line or poop off to the side. Some people call that curbing their horse in Connecticut. They taught them to poop on the side of the trail. Um, but you would have to like drink or ingest the manure by touching the soil and not wa washing your hands, which hopefully no one will be doing that. Um, and then we crossing the streams. Um, one thing I like to do too, she was talking about giving the horse time to practice crossing. Another thing you can do is use what I call the sandwich effect, where you have an experienced horse in front of the horse and experienced one behind it. And just try to have that person go forward confidently with those two horses 
um, kind of sandwiching it in the middle so that it just goes ahead. Um, a lot of times, some of the issues with streams is a lot of times the rider like hesitating. Um, I know one of my old trainers always said like, it's never the horse, it's always the rider. And I have to say that even for me, like it's usually my, it's me, not my horse a lot of times. <laughs> like he might get scared by something, but I may not have done what I should have done to stop them, right? So we're gonna let the horse touch the water with their hoof. Like she said, sniff it, take a drink, encourage it to go forward. Um, and when you're going uphill, as we know, it changes the horse's center of gravity. So we kind of want to stay out of the horse's um, way. Again, that's where our breast collars come in handy. Um, and we want to lean forward just slightly to kind of center our weight over the horse and help it get up the hill. We're pretty bad here. We have fun running up hills once our horses are sufficiently trained. They get a lot of work in the ring, so they're pretty fit. Um, so we do that. Uh, I'm kind of known for that, actually. Um, and then when we go downhill, I never run downhill, I'll tell you that. We lean back slightly to keep our weight over the horse, right? And you just really have to trust your horse to pick its way, look up and ahead and let your horse go. And then, like we said, sudden emergence of wildlife can cause a horse to spook since they are a prey animal. So it's good to have a horse at the lead that is pretty bold because if they're not, that makes all of the horses wanna run away. Um, so, and also, like she said, keep, teach the horse to recover rapidly through ground handling and exercise. So some other things we can do to practice, a one rein stop is never a bad idea to know how to do that because what if a rain breaks or something out on the trail? Um, desensitizing them to different things. Um, Stacy West Huffball has her thing called stick and string. Um, crossing over foreign objects, um, introducing an exercise ball, uh, ball in a water hole. So we just, you know, slow a horse down on the trail to slow, show our control and trust and let them um, investigate any unfamiliar objects, just stay patient with them, reward them for any success. And the more time we put them in safe situations, the more confidence they're gonna have in us. So as their riders. And those are my resources. Yay. This is the Connecticut Horse Council. They have a horse patrol and youth can be in it as well. So they go out and help the um, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection to patrol the trails. And they also do like public safety, like provide in information and help people who are lost and first aid and that's it thanks guys thanks for having me well thank you jan okay guys so uh like i said we already have on our website the trail riding project i'm going to put the guidelines there uh this video is also going to be uh, a link is going to be on our website as well as well as Facebook, and I'm going to send to the listserv that I have for the leaders and also um, and the speakers are going to send me their PowerPoint. So everybody that made a PowerPoint, send them to me. Bernice already did. So we can uh, we can make a PDF and also share uh, on our website. OK, uh, since I don't have anybody that registered, I don't have somebody registered, so I don't have the emails of everybody that are here. So I'm just going to send to everyone on the listserv. Uh, so if, because this is counting as recertification hours, I need everybody, if you haven't put your name, last name, and also your county, uh, otherwise I can't keep up with you all, uh, name, last name, county, so we can actually contact your agent and um, tell, or you can actually also, uh, ha you have your sheet uh, to give to your agent and I can confirm that you guys attended. Uh, the other thing too, in that guideline, we're going to have the, the logging, the tracking, the logging hours. And I already talked about this in the beginning. There, there are a few uh, apps that you can use on your phone. I know not everybody has a smartphone, but if you do, this uh, can be great as well. And the other thing, the last thing that I want to say is let's go and have fun. Let's try to, you know, uh, we've been coming out of like a horrible time. Uh, 2020 was terrible. Let's start 2021. We're trying to uh, restart our lives, right? With a little bit more fun than what it ended in 2020, like in March when everything had to stop. So that's what I want us to do, guys, to go out, have fun, um, have fun with the kids and let's encourage, you know, being outside and having exercise and breathing fresh air. It's good for everyone. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate uh, to send me an email and then I can um, direct the question to whoever speaker you um, are wanting to uh, ask the question. So once again, go to our website and all of this is going to be there uh, in one packet. Okay, sounds good. Any questions, guys? Because if you do have any questions, it's okay to ask now also.
No, good. There's apparently there's a storm happening and it's very strong winds that are supposed to be happening. So what a good day. Uh, be careful, everyone. Stay safe. Don't send it this way. <laughs> Maybe we'll all get to trail ride together someday. I look forward to that. <laughs> Absolutely. So one of the, the programs that we're also going to be adding later on is going to be horse packing, okay? So we're gonna like pack the horse and go camping with our horses. Kim is going to be leading that group. Uh, it's going to be first, maybe like more local to her area. And then later on, maybe 2022 or 2023, we are going to open uh, for state applic for people to apply from state. It's gonna be just for seniors, uh, for HRs, and it's gonna be maybe five or six throughout the state that are gonna be picked based on their knowledge and skills and everything, because it's gonna be a little bit more rough than just going for a trail ride, but it's gonna develop a lot of leadership and character on these kids. Uh, any questions, guys? No, we're good? Okay, so thank you again. Have a wonderful and lovely uh, end of your night and a good weekend ahead. Take care, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.